That's Friday. Friday the 13th. Does it bother anybody? Friday the 13th? Doesn't bother me. Let's talk about movies I watched this week. I watched one on uh, Netflix called Anna. It's still on. I'm pretty sure it's still on there. Yeah. Uh, what's her name? Sassana Luss? Helen Mar Marin? Yeah. She's in it. Luke Evans. Yeah, Luke Evans. You know Luke Evans? Professor Marston and the Wonder Woman? He's in it. It's about Russians. The Russians. I think this young girl, a hit woman, or a hit girl, or whatever you want to call her. She goes around killing people. It's alright. Give it a seven. Nothing to write home about. We'll have to watch. But it's the kind of movie, you don't, you don't have to watch it again. I've seen it once, it's like, it's alright. Helen Marin's the best part about the movie. She's an old Russian. She's in charge of the girl killing everybody. Plays a good part. Then I watched Morning Glory. Catherine Hepburn. Morning Glory. Catherine Hepburn. It's about a starstruck young girl. She shows up in New York. Eh? Shows up in New York. Her name's uh, Linda Lovelace. And she tries to succeed on stage. You know, the place in New York City. So she tries to succeed in, you know, in being a star, right? And she goes to these, uh, she goes to this apartment house where all the people are, stages are, and they invite her. They think they're going to get a laugh and all that stuff. Well, maybe they did, but uh, does she become a star? Well, you're going to have to watch it to find out. It's 1933, Catherine Hepburn. Yeah. Then I watched a movie called Stage Mother, 1933 also. Alice Bray. Maureen O'Sullivan. You know Maureen O'Sullivan? Does that name sound familiar? Pretty sure she's the girl that's in T Tarzan playing Jane. You know Jane? Mm. Yeah, she has some good scenes playing Tarzan. Me, Tarzan, you, Jane. Yeah. Yeah, well, and Francois Tone? He's in a lot of movies. Pretty sure I'm saying his name right. Franchot? F R A N C H O T? Tone? T O N E? Correct me if I'm saying it wrong. You know the you know the routine, right? If I'm wrong, correct me for sure. Anyway, she's in Rod Valdeville. Her Alice Ray and her husband's in Valdeville, right? She's pregnant. She's having a baby, so she can't do the stage work. But he's up high in those places where you swing from, eh? And you know, do things on the swing and swinging around. Anyway, he falls off breaks his head and he dies, so she's left alone with the baby. She brings up her daughter. She wants her daughter to be a star and a dancer, right? So, and that's Marino Sullivan. So, that's all about her. Alice Bright trying to get her daughter to be a star on stage in Baldeville. Yeah, so that's very good. I like that one. Gets a sex, six. Did I say Morning Glory gets a six also? Yeah, a six. Oh, you know, Larry of the Three Stooges? He has a bit part in it for about a minute, eh? He's standing on in front where they're, you know, they, they used to sell the music, right? The sheet music, you know, the people sing there or play a piano and they sing the song. Well, he's there standing there. He wants to buy some sheet music. You, you can tell it's Larry Pine, eh? <laughs> Yeah, and Ted Healy's in it a lot, too. The guy that had the Three Stooges in the beginning, they worked with him, he's in it, too. I got the door open for a while. Well, as soon as I'm finished doing the video, I'm going to turn the air conditioner back on. It's hot here in Toronto. Oh, boy. Got to put air on your ding-dongs. Oof. Don't tell us the well that stage mother should say that stage mother gets a six. Yeah. Marino Sullivan, like I said, she's in Tarzan. I'm pretty sure she's Jane. No, this one here, this is next up. Don't tell a soul from 2020. 
Uh, Jack Dylan Grazier, he's the young guy in it. Anyway, him and his brother. Him and his brother. His brother's older, he's a punk, right? There's a house that's uh, all covered up with tarps because they're spraying it for uh, bed bugs or something like that, right? So his big brother gets an idea, they're gonna go in the place and rob it. There's money in the drawer in there, right? And a tin can he's found out. So he goes in there, they rob the place. Anyway, they're running along the, you know, through the woods, the street, and the security guard's standing there. Hey, you guys, come back! Anyway, they take off and this guy, they're running through the woods. And the security guy falls, falls in a big hole. A big friggin' hole. Hey, he's gone, right? And he's yelling, help, help. Anyway, they go back, take a look at the guy. He broke his ankle. So they go home. The two boys go home and think about it. <laughs> yeah. That's a little bit different than that. There's things in the movie that things change a little bit, right? So it's not bad, it's not good. I gave it a six. Don't tell a soul. All right, what else did I watch? Oh, The Man Who Came to Dinner. <clears throat> the Man Who Came to Dinner. Betty Davis. Monty Woolley. He's the guy that was in, uh, uh, was a bishop's wife. As the professor, the old guy, right, that uh, Dudley fills up his wine bottles for him. Yeah, he's a radio announcer. He gets to go to these uh, persons. Pe Billy Burke, you know, Billy Burke. She was in uh, uh, what was it, 1939 movie, The Wizard of Oz, as Glenda the Good Witch. She's in it. No, well, it only goes to their house, right? Because I think his hotel's not right. His room's not right. Anyway, he's going up the stairs. He falls, falls down hurts himself. Yeah, he's sitting in a wheelchair, he can't go nowhere. So he's in this, these people's houses yelling, doing his normal thing. So Betty Davis is his uh, secretary. So he's in there holding court, yelling at everybody, insulting them and all this stuff. He's suing everybody, the whole, you know, suing everybody. Betty Davis meets up with a guy from the newspaper. She starts going out with him. Yeah, it's a pretty good story. It takes place around Christmas time, December. So I gave that a seven. It's a good story. You haven't seen uh, the man who came to dinner. Just, just watch it. And the unfaithful. Anne Sheridan gets entangled in murder. Yeah. It's a remake of the letter. You seen the letter? It's a remake of that. Yeah, Anne Sheridan. She's in her house. Somebody comes to her house. She kills the guy. You know, she kills him. He's dead. Did you know this guy? No, I never saw him before in my life. She killed him. Anyway, then the story starts. Well, maybe she did know the guy. But anyway, Eve Arden's in it too. One of her friends. It's a good story. Give it a seven. The Unfaithful, 1947. Ann Sheridan. Pretty good movie. And what else did I watch? Oh, I watched The Opposite Sex musical. A musical. June Allison. She sings a few songs, not much. There's not much singing going on, but it's a musical. And Joan Collins. A young, very pretty, nice, bouncy Joan Collins. Well, Joan Collins takes June Allison's wife, husband, away. You know, one of those movies. Now she gets the June Allison gets to go away to a countryside with all the other divorcees and stuff like that, and so she's enjoying herself there. And then she goes back home, and then she decides to play the game and get her husband back. Remake of the Women, 1939. Pretty good. I give it seven. The Opposite Sex, 1956. So now these movies I'm telling you about all straight to the point. I'm not giving you all stories and. All kinds of stuff. I'm just telling you what I watched this week, right? <clears throat> These are not, um, you know, reviews, I guess. You know, a review. I was reviewing a movie. I'd probably spend five minutes on one movie, but I'm not. So I'm just telling you, as always, on a Friday, what I watched this week. I and mean, if you should watch it, you know, if you want to. Anyway, I watched The Crowded Sky. This was on TCM, too. This popped up on TCM. It's a disaster movie. It was a friggin' disaster. I watched it for two friggin' hours. Hold on. Don't go away. It was a disaster for Bob. I'm sitting there going, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. So, 
When's the plane gonna fly a uh, fall out of the sky? No, not yet, eh? No? Oh, okay. So the best thing to do if you watch this movie, The Crowded Sky from 1960, starring Dean Andrews, he's the pilot. Skip ahead an hour and a half, an hour and a half, and you'll get to see some disaster movie. But other than that, it's boring as shit. It's a shit bucket of shit. Hot steaming friggin' monkey shit, as Ian would say. Yeah, it's gets a three. Nah, don't watch it. If it punk comes up, you pops up somewhere, don't bother. I'm saving you I'm saving you time and money. You're better off to watch the Transformers. Alright, that gets a three. Next next. The heart is a lonely hunter. This is TCM also, 1968. A deaf man moves to a small town to make friends. Well, his brother, he's deaf and dumb too. His brother gets put away in a home, I guess. That's what you call it. All right, so he's got to be put away. He, he goes out in the middle of the night and breaks windows and eats cakes and cookies and stuff like that. He's a little bit off. So the deaf guy's brother is still, he's all right. He works as a, what do you call it? He marks on metal. Silver, right? He engraves silver. So he's a go there, right? And he starts making friends, you know? He makes a doctor friend. And he makes a friend in a house that he's rooming in. He's got a room. And he makes a friend in Sondra Locke, a young girl that's going to school. And he, uh, she likes the, the, you know, the music, what do you call it, uh, Beethoven and stuff like that. So he, pl he buys a couple of records and he, they listen to it together. He's all right. He's nothing wrong with him, but yeah. So we story about him, uh, but you know, so I can't tell you anymore about it because it will spoil it. Yeah. But if you get a chance to watch The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, 1968, I gave it a seven. It's worth a watch. All right, what else? Oh, I watched All the Young Men, 1960. It's a Korean War tale. Sidney Poitier, is that how you say his name? Alan Ladd and James Darren. James Darren never ages, eh? He was a teenager in the 50s and he's a teenager in the 60s. Yeah. <clears throat> so, it's about the Korean War. Um, so they have to, they're, they're, they're in this house or a big house and it, it's in the middle of a pass, right? And the Koreans are coming, the, the army, and they have to stand there and use machine guns and everything, and, you know, stop them from going through. So it's, you know, people get killed, they get machine gunned, and it's, it's all right. But there was one scene in it, and I noticed, sometimes you notice these things, as they're shooting everybody, right? They're shooting everybody out there, all the Korean guys, they're all falling down. They got, you know, machine gun. they're all laying all over the place. Right, they're dead, they're all over the place. And then a while it goes by, and then you show another scene, and you give me another shot out there, right? And there's nobody there. You know what I mean? There's nobody out there anymore laying dead. They're all gone, so... I don't know who came by and picked them all up and took them away, but I thought that was kind of... You know, whoever... What are you supposed to be paying attention to a movie? I mean, there's a lot of movies where you see... Uh, uh, people, the men dying in war and they're all out there and the scenes go back again and they're still laying there, right? The, you know, things are still the same. And nothing changes, but this one... All the men, all the Korean guys are all gone. They're not there anymore. I thought that was kind of weird. But anyway, uh, what did I give it? All the Young Men, 1960. Alan Ladd, yeah, James Darren, Sidney Poitier, I gave it a seven. It's not a bad movie, it's worth a watch. Then I watched Five Graves to Carol. Carol? Ca Carol? C A I R O. Carol? 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 Anyway, 1943, here is Tony again, excuse me, Ann Baxter, lovely girl. Francis Tony, he's in a tank. Everybody in the tank's dead, right? So he gets up on top of the tank, hangs out the tank, tank hits a bump in the desert and he falls out. Tries to catch up at the tank, tank's buggering off down you know, down the hill, whatever. So anyway, he ends up going in into this, I guess you want to call it a village, and he walks into a bar, like a hotel kind of thing. 
And there's two people in there, Ann Baxter and the owner of the bar, right? And then uh, you hear the people coming, the tanks are coming and all that, it's a Rommel, right? And the tanks and some people coming with him, German soldiers. So Francis Tone plays the part of, as a waiter, as a waiter in the in the bar, right? Nobody knows that he's, uh, you know, is actually a tank driver, you know, a lieutenant in tank uh, corps. Anyway, he uh, finds out some things uh, about Rommel and why, where he's going to go when he's trying to get to get out of there and go tell the British Army what's going on. So, five, bra yeah, five graves to Carol. Carol? Carol. <laughs> Ann Baxter, French Atone, directed by Billy Wilder. Yes. The House of Mirth. The House of Mirth. 2000. Gillian Anderson. She was in The X Files. Remember the TV show that ran for 11 or 10 or 12 years? Eric Stoltz and Dan Agroyd. Angroyd. 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 Early, in the early 1900s in New York. And Gillian Anderson doesn't play the game. She lives with her aunt. Her aunt's a rich person, right? And Gillian Anderson goes out and she goes to plays and shows and hangs out with her friends and pinky tea and stuff like that. But there's other girls that, you know, do the same thing as she does. But some of them are kept by the men, right? You know, the rich men, you know, they set them up in places. Well, you know, they try to get her to do that and she still knows. But she plays cards, eh? She gambles. And uh, one of the men lend her money, that, or, or she, yeah, loves, lends her money, and she wins money, and she gives it back to the guy to invest. Anyway, that didn't work out too well, right? So now she's kind of like, she's in trouble now. Cause she has to pay it back all this money, and she doesn't have any money. So yeah, so it's it's complicated, complicated. Uh, Eric Stoltz, yeah, and Gillian Anderson. Uh, so yeah, so she doesn't play the game. They want her to, you know, you have to watch the movie to get what I'm telling you. I give it a six. It's all right, you know, but you don't have to watch it again. You watch it once, it's good, you know, unless you want to repeat myself. But unless you want to watch it again. But uh, yeah, it's, it's not bad. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, I can't tell you the ending. I want to, but I can't. Dangerous. House of Mirth. I get, what did I give it? A six. Dangerous. Betty Davis. Franch on tone. There he is again. Betty Davis. She's an, an actress. She was an actress. She's a big time actress. Everybody loved her. Well, she doesn't have very good luck. Let's say she's a jinx. She jinx. She, she messes things up. She's a drunk. She, she's a drunk. She sets some bars and knocks back vodkas, right? And gets pissed, loaded, and then she goes home. I don't know where she gets her money from, but anyway, she, she's loaded. French Tone comes along, right? And he starts to her. She passes out in the bar, and he takes her home, right? Puts her in bed, or his, or his maid does, you know. She wakes up and starts yelling at everybody. Doesn't know where she's at. And then they, things get a little bit better, and then he wants to put her in a play, right? Like, you know, to get her sober. And she does get sober. She gets nice, and she's okay. And then, uh, you know, he borrows money on his money to start this play up. And uh, then, you know, they're lovey-dovey. And then he wants Francis Stone character, wants to get married. And she's, well, you know, she's humming and hawing. And, you know, okay, give me the, it all does, uh, you know, Francis Stone's character that uh, she's already married. Yeah. Yeah. So... Yeah, so there you go. That's the story. So does she uh, get a divorce to marry this guy, or what happens there? Does she make the the play? That's uh, you know he invested eighty thousand dollars. Does he get his eighty thousand dollars back, or does he keep it? Or does he run with the play? Does she star in it and all this shit? Well, you're gonna have to watch the movie if you can ever find it. Yeah, nineteen thirty-five. I gave it a seven. The whole town is talking. <coughs> dangerous the whole town is talking now this movie 
is directed by John Ford. Stars Edward G. Robinson and Jean Arthur. Yes, Jean Arthur. She's a bubbly actress. Everything she's in, she's happy. She seems to be... I don't know, Jean Arthur has something... I don't know what you want to call it. Bubbly? There's, there's something to her. She's, she's a good actress. Yeah, Edward G. Robinson, Jean Arthur. Now, Jean, uh, Edward G. Robinson plays the part of two, two, two characters. One's a shy guy, he's working in an office, he's doing numbers, you know, clicking numbers, adding things up, right? He's there, right? Doing his thing and all that. Other people are behind him in the desk doing the same thing he's doing. Jean Arthur sets behind him and stuff. Anyway, now the guy's reading a newspaper, he's looking at the newspaper, and this is gangster, right? That's wanted, right? You know what? He looks just like... He looks just like... What's his name? The guy that's in the office. Tight, you know, doing the money thing. Adding up. You're looking at him and going like that, looking at him. And, they're, and that's the part that's in, their, in, their, in a restaurant, too. When they're in a restaurant... What's his name? Well, I forget his name now. The actor. He's in a lot of movies, too. Freak. I gotta remember for what his name. But he's reading his... You know, eating his soup and... And he's looking at his newspaper and he's looking over at Edward G. Robinson and he, uh, he goes to the phone booth and he phones up and he says to Gangster, what, well, Minx or Manx or whatever his name is, this here. All the cops show up, <laughs> the guns and everything, to go over in the restaurant and pick up Edward G. Robinson. They think he's the gangster, right? And he's saying, no, no, I'm not a gangster, I'm just a bookkeeper, right? Anyway, they haul him away. An Edward G. Robinson character shows up at his apartment. And then they change places. It's hilarious. The whole town is talking, 1935. Edward G. Robinson and Jane Arthur gets a, oh, it gets a seven. See, a decent seven. Something that you want to get in the chinos. And then what else did I watch? Anyway, I'm getting to the end. So then I watch this, this movie right here, Alive. 1993 Alive. I went to the show and seen this with Kathy and her brother, Donald. We went to the show to see this. And I'm telling you, this is I think this is a remake of another movie from the year before. Anyway, but anyway, Alive, it's got Ethan Hawke in it, right? Ethan Hawke. Mike's uh, buddy, right? He like, Mike likes Ethan Hawke. He's got lots of his movies. Um, but anyway, it's, a, it's about a rugby team. Right? It's going to go play another rugby team. Then they're in an airplane and they, they're going over the Andes, the mountains, right? The mountain range. And they're flying, that rain's all cloudy and everything. And they're going up so many feet and they're coming down and the plane's rattling and shit like that, right? And then uh, they hit a, a little bit of a mountain. They hit the mountain, like to skim the top of a mountain and they're trying to pull up. And they cr Anyway, what did they do? The back end of the plane, right? The tail end of the plane busts us off, right? Bodies and chairs and everything go flying, right? The wings fall off. Now there's only left this, the, you know, the body of the plane. The body of the plane hits the mountain and the ice and the snow and comes to a stand, stand still kind of thing. And there's everybody there. People are broken, their legs are broken, heads are broken, and people are dead in the plane. And oh, what a fucking mess. Anyway, that was a mess. So look, this movie's what's that word? It gets you queasy when you watch it. Well, you know, I watched it on the big screen. It was really queasy, right? So anyway, that's a seven. Yeah, uh, Vincent. Uh, yeah, yeah, Vincent Spano and Ethan Hawke. Yeah, true story about the rugby team. They spent seventy-two days on top of that mountain, seventy-two days, and they had to do some things that weren't very nice to to survive. If they didn't, they would have all died. But yeah, they did things to, to live, put it that way. All right, that's it for uh, this week, people. It's hot and humid here in Toronto. I got the door open, like I said, just basically to make this video. Now I'm gonna have a lunch. I'm watching uh, and Rock on uh, Rock on uh, Netflix. Right? About Thor and the Giants and all that stuff. Yeah, I've been watching that. I've watched the first season now. I'm one or two episodes into the second one. So now I'm going to watch that now for lunch. Sit there and have a sandwich. Have a sandwich. All right. 
supposed to be a nicer day tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow I'll get out and go for a walk. Who knows? All right. Enjoy watching those movies. And give your mother a hug. Until then, until next week.